Uh, welcome here. Welcome here to all our guests as well. Um, for those, uh, if we haven't had a chance to meet, my name is Dave. I'm one of our pastors and great season friends from way back when. The Mulroy family over here. Great to have you guys. There's a, there's a country song. Yes, I do listen to country sometimes. I grew up with Willie Nelson, though, and Patsy Cline, and... You know, some of those, well, Kenny Rogers a little bit, but there's a, there's a country song that gets a lot of radio play at the moment, and for good reason, I think. Because we can relate, perhaps, all too easily. Eric Church sings, If I could kill a word and watch it die, I'd poison, never shoot goodbye. Beat regret when I felt I had the nerve. Yeah, I'd pound fear to a pile of sand, choke lonely out with my bare hands. I'd hang hate so that it could not be heard. If only I could kill a word. Then the chorus, give me sticks, give me stones, bend my body, break my bones, use staff and rod to turn me black and blue. Because you can't unhear, you can't unsay. But if it were up to me to change, I'd turn lies and hate to love and truth. If only if only, if only I could kill a word. When I hear this song, I think, yes, please. Boy, I long for a world where lies and hate really are turned to something different, to love and truth. And so do you, if I were to make a guess. And then I think, yeah, the singer is right to say, if only, if only I could. See, at the same time as the writer wants to see the world put right, a world that's transformed, a world where those words are no longer part of our vocabulary, at the same time as he wants to see it put right, he can't make it happen, and he knows it. Never finally, never fully, and guess what? Neither can you or I either. But what if? What if there was someone who can? The biblical storyline goes something like this. We find that, that God has always existed in a community. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And God created us from that relationship and for relationship. With himself, with others, with all of creation, in fact. But the first humans we find out in this story disbelieved God's goodness. They believed that God didn't really love them. That God didn't really want the best for them. That somehow they could find life on their own terms, not on his. And you know what? So do we. And this ends in, well, just watch the news for 20 minutes. And ask yourself, is this how things should be? Of course not, we answer. Things are really not as they should be. And we, all of us, we know that in our bones. That's why we relate to the song lyrics. Why does he sing, if only I could kill a word? If? Why the if? Because you and I are unable to root out the issue. Because the issue happens to be in you and I. The root issue isn't out there as though it's someone else who's causing the problem. It's right here in my own heart. It's the needy beast within me that just makes these choices. They seem so subtle, so innocent. But honestly, it's just putting myself ahead of others. It's living for, for me rather than for you. And I see it. I see it in those moments where I lack impatience, or where I lack patience, often with my children. It's in those moments I lack self-control. And I hate it every time I see it. And so I know that that solution is not going to come just from within. No, but, but the promise of the gospel is that there is someone who can and does come to end all evil, to kill all of those words, rooted out of our hearts. Good Friday is good because Jesus, God in human flesh, allows death to come upon him. And yet, what we're celebrating today is that he deals death, the death blow, through his own death and resurrection. See, Jesus allows himself to experience death on our behalf. From the cross, Jesus says, it is finished. 
And it, and it is. And it was. Our debt is now paid in full. We can be restored in relationship to God. That is why Good Friday is so good. God pays our debt so that we don't have to. But, we might say, how, how do we know that's true? It's a great question. Anyone can, as Jesus does, simply claim to deal with your sin and restore us to right relationship with God. Sure you can, our skeptical selves might say. See, had Jesus' story ended on the cross, it would be obvious that he was a fraud. I mean, Jesus himself claimed that he would come back three days later from the grave. But what if? What if Friday isn't the end of Jesus? We're going to look at Matthew's gospel, his report of Jesus' resurrection. But just before we read that resurrection chunk in 28, we actually have to go back. Because Matthew is setting us up in even the burial story for the rest of the story. The events of Good Friday have just happened, and they don't look good at all. Jesus is hanging there on a Roman cross, lifeless. Then what do we see? Matthew 27, 57, if you have your Bibles open. As evening approached, this is on Friday, there came a rich man from Arimathea named Joseph, who had himself become a disciple of Jesus. Going to Pilate, he asked for Jesus' body, and Pilate ordered that it be given to him. Joseph took the body, wrapped it in clean linen cloth, and placed it in his own new tomb that he had cut out of the rock. Why all that detail? He rolled a big stone in front of the entrance of the tomb and went away. Mary Magdalene and the other Mary were sitting there opposite the tomb. Again, why those details? Do we really need to know that? The next day, the one after preparation day, the chief priests and Pharisees went to Pilate. Sir, they said, we remembered that while he was still alive, that deceiver said, after three days, I'll rise again. So give the order for the tomb to be made secure until the third day. Otherwise, the disciples might come and steal the body and tell people that he's been raised from the dead. This last deception will be worse than the first. Take a guard, Pilate answered. Go, make the tomb secure as you know how. So they went made the tomb secure by putting a seal on the stone and posting the guard. There's something really interesting about this section. Yeah, I'm, I'm not much of a chess player, um, but every time, I, I, let me ask you a question, have you ever watched someone who really is a good chess player or played against them? Something always happens. They make moves that anticipate, that prepare for what they will do later in the game. They move a rook here and a pawn there. Why are they doing that, I think? And soon enough I find out, oh, oh, <laughs> that's why. And then I lose. Um, so in, in some ways, that's what Matthew was doing with these details. He's setting the stage. He's making the preparatory moves on the chessboard, you might say, before he draws the story to its climax. See, Matthew, like a skilled chess player, he knows that there's objections what he's about to say next. See, the central claim of the Christian story is that Jesus has been raised after being really and truly dead. And many people laughed off this claim and offered alternate explanations. One Bible scholar puts it like this, he wasn't really dead, he said. Or maybe the disciples stole their body, or maybe someone else did, or perhaps the women went to the wrong tomb. And so like a skillful chess player, our writer addresses each of these objections up front before he's even told the story. Notice the tomb wasn't new. It was recognizable. We are told whom it belonged to and who prepared it. That it was new matters as well because in ancient Jewish burial practice, a tomb would actually have more than one body in it, right? These are kind of above ground. Um, into the side of a bank, and there would be several shelves, and bodies would be put into the tomb. And what would happen is after about a year, the bodies decompose now, and there's just a pile of bones there. And they would gather up the bones and put them in an ossuary or a bone box. But this is a new tomb, Matthew tells us. It's just been cut out of the rock. We know who it belongs to. 
There's no mistaking which body is it this one that's missing or another. And the women, it tells us they knew where the tomb was and they were sitting opposite when Joseph laid, lays Jesus' body there. No mistake. And then after reporting on the resurrection, Matthew, and we'll read that in a moment, Matthew will then report how this story about Jesus' body being stolen gets circulated. Just look with me at uh, 28, 11 to 15 for a moment. It says this, while the women were on their way, they've just met the risen Jesus, 